Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 37 to 38. I'm reading from New King James Version. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? May the Lord bless this reading. Our speaker this morning is a dedicated and faithful servant of God. She is our head elder of the Joy of Troy Church. Let's give our time to Elder Annette Barnes. Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear as the daylight fades into deep night shades does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him does he see? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would come into each of our homes today or wherever we are tuning in from. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts that you would draw our hearts and our minds up and worship to you today. That we would just open ourselves to you to allow you to, to see and to know everything that is going on inside of us right now. Lord, sometimes we ask, does Jesus care? I pray that in Jesus' name that you would be with us today that you would guide in this sermon and just draw us a little bit closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We just heard um, a scripture read before this sermon. And I, I just wanna I just want to read it again from the New International Version. It's Mark 4, verses 37 and 38. And it says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. You know, I, I think it's interesting. It says a furious squall came up. That, that almost sounds like to me that it's like this, this um, you know, tumult came up. It was just a squall, right? Not, not, not anything very serious, but it was a furious squall. The disciples feared for their lives and they were fishermen. They were part of the sea, in a sense. They worked on it every day. They were used to storms. But here, verse 37 says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? Have you ever been going along in that life knowing that Jesus was with you? And that Jesus may have even put you in the place you are now and you know you're where God wants you to be. You know that Jesus is with you. And then something and fearful on awful suddenly comes upon you. You've experienced storms before, but not like this one. And you look to God and you wonder if he is sleeping. Have you ever thought 
don't you care, Jesus? There was a father in the Bible named Job. And I want us to turn to Job chapter one. We're going to read, start with verse one, Job chapter one. And Job chapter one, starting with verse one says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes, and on their birthdays, they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. You see, Job was a father, constantly praying and interceding for his children. In verse 13 of Job chapter one, it says, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. And they put the servants to the sword. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. I want us to look at a little flashback. Fall 2019, uncontrollable wildfires broke out in Australia. By November 2019, the fires in Australia had worsened substantially. Heavy rains came in January of 2020, and again in February, which considerably helped the firefighters contain the fires, mostly. A map showing every fire that had been in Australia during this, this season showed that nearly the entire continent had been on fire. I repeat, an entire continent, basically on fire. Billions of dollars of properties damaged more than 1 billion animals estimated to be killed. It was a long, horrifying event for the entire world to watch. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? In the meantime, on November 17, 2019, during the height of the uncontrollable fires in the continent of Australia, experts now believe that the first case of COVID-19 was found in a 55-year-old individual in China. COVID-19 quickly spread to the entire globe, a pandemic. The world shut down and suffers together. As the burdens press and the cares distress, and the way grows weary and long. The pandemic rages on. Over 400,000 dead worldwide, 116,000 in the US alone and counting. I actually had to update that number last night from when I wrote those words earlier this week. Indeed, the experts say it is coming back in the fall and it is projected that tens of thousands more will die. Before we have a chance to recover from this crisis, the human race turns on itself on camera. One atrocity happening on the heels of another, 
caught on camera, stirring up, causing great pain, anguish, and fear. Protests are not just seen all over the United States, but all over the world. France, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Hungary, Denmark, Scotland, Sweden, Switzerland, Portugal, Italy, Kenya, the UK, Spain, Brazil, South Korea, Japan, Poland, Israel, just to name a few. People in fear for their lives and or the lives of their families, the world is in great suffering and pain. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless fed, dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? We have not been able to get through one crisis before another hits. How much more can we take? I did not even mention the earthquakes, hurricanes, and volcanoes that frightened us and devastated parts of this world that still have not recovered. We struggle, we fear, we, tremend we experience tremendous loss and anguish together. Our hearts cry out to God. In Romans 8, 22, God says that, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. We know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together till now. The world, it appears, is going through a Job experience. Back to Job chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Job chapter 1, verse 18. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? Verse 20 says, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped. This father tore his clothes, shaved his head, and fell down to the ground when he found out that his children were dead. They were his children. The dearest on earth. The dearest on earth may be different at different times for us. The dearest on earth might be a person. It might be a way of life. It might be our health. It might be security. It might be a paradigm shift. Our entire being is shaken to its very core. What we once thought to be true is, is no longer true. Our hearts, our very souls cry out to God. It does not matter who you are. We are all experiencing some sort of grief, loss, or potential for loss that brings anguish to our hearts. We have all lost something or someone. We all fear additional loss. We cry out to God, sometimes with silent tears that no one else sees or understands but God. The groanings of our hearts may be so great that like Hannah, our lips move but no words come out and others misunderstand our intentions. Only the Holy Spirit can interpret. Romans 8, 26 says that the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, the spirit groans with us. Where is our father during these times? 
Does Jesus care? I want us to look at another story in the Bible in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, starting with verse 46, 45, Matthew 27, 45 and 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Can you imagine for three hours from noon until three o'clock, right in the middle of the day, darkness comes over the land, a thick darkness, something you could feel. Imagine how you would feel if you were experiencing that. Verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Turn to Luke 23, verse 44. Luke 23, verse 44 through 46. It was now about noon. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the st sun stopped shining. That's how dark it was. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Both of these statements happened at three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus cries out, asking God, why has he forsaken him? And in the next breath, he gives himself to the father who seems so far, far away. An innocent, suffer suffering incredible torture and pain from those that he loved the most. The heart-wrenching cry of God because of separation. And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it aught to him? Does he see? Matthew 27, back to Matthew 27, verse 51. 51 and 52. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Oh, the grief of the father's heart. The father's heart was so pained that he tore in half the veil in the most important building on the earth. He removed his presence from the most holy place. He caused such ter a terrible earthquake that people were shaken together in clumps and split rocks open so that the graveyards were in shambles and dead people were lying around all weekend. You see, they were waiting to be resurrected on Sunday when Christ was resurrected. The father's son was dead and he did not do anything to stop us from killing his son. Because if he did, he would have lost us also. Jesus may not have, op may have opened not his mouth, as the Bible says. But the father did not let his son die. Roman guards changed their minds immediately. Verse 54 of Matthew 27 states, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. Our grief, my grief. 
sometimes our hearts are so full, we cannot express what's in them, the grief that's in them. But the Bible does try. I'm reminded of Habakkuk chapter one. Habakkuk chapter one, if we could turn there. Verses two through four. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And there's Amos chapter five. Amos chapter five, another little book in the Bible, these minor prophets that had such gut-wrenching experiences. Amos chapter five, starting with verse 16. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God Almighty says, God himself says, there will be wailing in all the streets and the cries of the anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, verse 18. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness and not light. This is what it will be like. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him one thing right after the other. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a, a ray of brightness as if the sun stopped shining? At the crucifixion, the whole world, the entire universe saw on camera that Satan only wants to destroy that Satan would kill God himself. Not everyone in the universe believed that Satan would actually kill God until they saw it played out in front of them. You know, there's a passage in Desire of Ages that talks about this. In Desire of Ages, it says, not until the death of Christ, not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings, even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. For 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting. This is still in Desire of Ages. For 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and degradation. And the heavenly universe beheld it all. You see, there was something happening in unseen worlds that we do not know anything about. Job's trouble was caused by an accusation brought by Satan to God in front of the angels and other worlds that Job's motivations and loyalties to God were because of God's presumed favorism, favoritism. But, God, uh, but Job knew nothing about this conversation between Satan and God. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is what we see, and that's why we think that's our struggle. But against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. You see, there's another father in this story, the father of lies. And he goes around deceiving the nations. Let's turn to John chapter 8, verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. 
Jesus is speaking to the Jews who used to believe in him, the ones who did believe in him. And apparently they changed their minds. And this is what he said to them. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. You see, he was a murderer from the beginning, but they didn't realize it till just now. Not holding to the truth for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's the father of lies. He seemed believable for 4,000 years. But now, finally, everyone in the universe now sees Satan's true motive to take out God and to take his place. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. You see, Jesus knew this. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. He knew that Satan was a deceiver. He knew he was a father of lies. And so Jesus says during his crucifixion, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. 4,000 years. We have been deceived. We don't understand what we are doing. We're still deceived. That's why we sin. The reason that we follow the devil sometimes and we sin is because he deceives us. And we still haven't been able to see for thousands of years that the devil is trying to pull us away from God. We don't understand what we're doing. Now, now it is time to understand. Now is the time for understanding. Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? Do you understand what is happening now? Even God himself was not immune from the consequences of our sin. Because sin separates. Oh, the pain of separation. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit could not bear to be separated from us, their children. And so they allowed something that they had never experienced before. Separation from each other for a moment in time. The knowledge of God. The knowledge that God had of the resurrection did not prevent the pain of God. Does Jesus care? Have you ever been questioned? By what authority do you speak? Have you ever returned to your hometown only to have rocks thrown at you? Have you ever traveled a long distance to comfort friends who had lost a sick family member to death? only to be treated as if it were your fault that they had died? Have you ever brought that same person back to life only to have those who witnessed it plot your death because of that miracle? You did something wonderful for somebody else and they tried to kill you for it? Have you ever stood up to one of your friends who bullied an outcast in society only to have that same friend turn around and sell your life to the authorities for money because they were so angry by your rebuke? Have you ever spent entire nights worrying and praying for a troubled friend? Have you gone to that same friend and heard them say, I'm too tired to listen? Have you ever cried over someone because you just wanted to be their friend and they wanted nothing to do with you? Have you ever been beaten up because someone was jealous of you? When the chips were down, have you had your closest friend claim that they never knew you? Have you ever breathed your last knowing it is finished? Have you ever hurt have you ever cried? Have you ever suffered alone? Isaiah chapter 53, 
verses 3 through 5. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by men. We can say he is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, even still. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds, we are healed. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my savior cares. We're going to listen to this song, be sung at this time. I know my Savior cares. It is the thing to deeply form earth and soul as the birds press and the king. want to close with this prayer from Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. 
I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. Amen.